In 1930, if a tank hit a bump at 20 miles per hour, the impact didn't break the tank, it broke the driver's spine. Tank warfare had a speed limit, and it wasn't set by the engine, it was set by the human spine. Most tanks rode on leaf springs, stiff, rigid metal plates borrowed from trains. They were designed to carry weight, not to absorb shock. If a tank driver hit a trench at more than 10 miles per hour, the impact was catastrophic. The suspension would bottom out, sending a shockwave straight through the steel hull and into the crew's bodies. To go fast was to risk paralysis. So, the generals decided, tanks are slow, they are infantry support, they crawl. But while the army was obsessed with crawling, one man was obsessed with flying. John Walter Christie wasn't a soldier, he was a race car driver. Walter held the world speed record for V4 engines. When he looked at the army's tanks, he didn't see weapons, he garbage saw. He called their designs unsprung nightmares. He promised to build a machine that would make their tanks look like tractors. Walter realised that to fix the speed, he had to fix the geometry. The enemy was unsprung weight and vertical space. Standard tanks had short springs that offered maybe two inches of movement. To get more travel, you would need a spring three feet tall, which would make the tank a giant target. So, Walter did something brilliant. He decided to hide the suspension sideways. He invented the bell crank system. Look at the mechanics of his 1931 patent. When the massive road wheel hits a bump, it is pushed upward. But instead of compressing a spring directly, the wheel pushes a pivoting arm. This arm acts like a mechanical elbow, it takes that vertical force and rotates it 90 degrees. This rotation pushes against a massive coil spring that is mounted horizontally inside the tank's hull. Because the spring is lying flat, it can be incredibly long. Walter used springs that were nearly two feet long, allowing the wheel to move up and down a massive 14 inches without ever hitting the bump stop. The result was physics defying. Because of that horizontal spring, the wheels could swallow huge boulders and trenches while the hull remained perfectly flat. Walter took his prototype to the US Army testing grounds. The generals watched in shock. Standard tanks crawled at 15 miles per hour. Walter's tank hit 60 miles per hour. It was a race car wrapped in steel. It was the fastest tank in the world. You would think the army would be ecstatic. They weren't, they were furious. The infantry generals said, it's too fast. Tanks are supposed to stay with the soldiers walking on foot. The cavalry generals said, the armor is too thin. But the real problem was Walter himself. He was arrogant. He shouted at the generals. He told them they were idiots who didn't understand mechanics. The US army rejected the design. They refused to buy it. Walter was bankrupt. He had spent his fortune building the ultimate machine and his own country had thrown it in the trash. But then a knock came at the door. Soviet agents. The Russians were preparing for a future war. They wanted speed. They had heard rumors of the American flying tank. They offered to buy the prototypes. But there was a problem. It was illegal to sell weapons to the Soviet Union. So Walter did something that would change the history of the world. He took the turrets off the tanks. He created them up. And on the shipping manifest, he didn't write tank. He wrote agricultural tractor. The US customs agents didn't check. The ship sailed. The fastest tank technology in the world was on its way to Moscow. 1931, the tractors arrive in the Soviet Union. The Russian engineers tear them apart. They are shocked. They have never seen a suspension like this. It is elegant. It is robust. And most importantly, it is fast. They immediately began cloning Walter Christie's design. They create the BT series, Bistrochodny tank, literally meaning fast tank. These tanks use Christie's exact suspension. They can drive on tracks for cross country, or, in a direct copy of Christie's patent, the crew can remove the tracks in 30 minutes and drive on the road wheels like a race car. For 10 years, the Soviets refined the design. They realised that convertible wheel drive is too complex, so they drop it. 
but they keep the soul of the machine, the Christie suspension. They take that long travel suspension and bolt it to a new sloping hull. They call it the T-34 and they hide it. The world has no idea it exists. June 1941. Hitler invades Russia. The German Wehrmacht is confident. Their Panzer III and IV tanks are technical marvels, precision engineered, comfortable, with excellent radios. They expect to face obsolete, clunky Soviet tanks that crawl at 10 miles per hour. For the first few weeks, it is a slaughter. The Germans advance hundreds of miles. But then, they hit the mud. The Russian Rasputitsa mud season arrives. The German panzers have a fatal flaw. Their suspension uses short leaf springs and narrow tracks. They sink. They get stuck. The German advance grinds to a halt. The crews are freezing, trying to dig out their 20-ton machines. And then they hear a sound, a high-pitched diesel whine. Out of the mist comes the T-34. The Germans watch in horror. While their tanks are drowning in mud, this Soviet tank is sliding over it. Why? The Christie suspension. Those massive road wheels and long travel springs allow the tracks to contour perfectly to the soft ground, spreading the weight. The T-34 doesn't fight the terrain, it flows over it. It is moving at 30 miles per hour in conditions where the Germans can't even move. The German gunners fire. Clang. The shells bounce off the sloped armour. The T-34 closes the distance. It destroys the German column and disappears back into the forest. It is a ghost. General Heinz Guderian, the father of the Blitzkrieg, writes a panicked report to Berlin. We have nothing that compares to this tank. Its mobility is superior to anything we possess. The Germans finally capture one. They drag it back to Germany to study it. They expect to find advanced Soviet technology. Instead, they open the hull and find American genius. They recognize the coil springs. They recognize the bell cranks. They realize that the machine destroying their army wasn't designed by a communist committee in Moscow. It was designed by an arrogant race car driver in New Jersey. While his invention was saving the Soviet Union, Walter Christie was in America. The US Army still refused to talk to him. He watched the newsreels of the Eastern Front. He saw the grainy footage of T-34s swarming the German army. He knew those were his children. But he wasn't the only one watching. Across the ocean, the British Army had also realised their mistake, and they were about to come knocking on Walter's door, asking for help. While the Soviets were using Walter's suspension to survive the mud in Russia, the British were using it to survive the sand in Africa. The British Army had realised early on that in the open desert, a tank battle wasn't like trench warfare. It was like naval warfare. You needed ships that were fast. You needed cruisers. So, they had secretly bought a Christie prototype too. They built an entire line of tanks based on his suspension. The cruiser, the Covenanter, and the famous Crusader. In the desert, speed was life. Field Marshal Rommel, the Desert Fox, was fast. His panzers were striking and retreating before the British could react. But the Christie suspended Crusader tanks changed the game. Because of those long coil springs, British commanders could push their tanks to 40 miles per hour over rough, rocky ground. They could flank the Germans. They could chase them. It was the Christie suspension that allowed the British 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats, to perform the high-speed manoeuvres that eventually broke the Africa Corps. But the ultimate evolution came in 1944. The British took the Christie suspension and put a Rolls-Royce Meteor engine inside it, a detuned Spitfire engine. The result was the Cromwell. It was the fastest British tank of the war. It could hit 40 miles per hour while carrying a 75 mm gun. German Tiger commanders reported that these British tanks were frantic, swarming around them, impossible to hit because they moved so smoothly over the broken ground of Normandy. But while his children, 
the T-34, the Crusader, the Cromwell, were liberating Europe, John Walter Christie was dying. And he was starving. The man whose invention was effectively winning the ground war for the Allies was bankrupt. The US government rarely paid him for his patents. They argued over technicalities. They delayed payments. He spent his final years trying to design a flying tank that could be dropped from a plane, but nobody would listen. January 11th, 1944. Christie dies. He didn't live to see D-Day. He didn't live to see the T-34 roll into Berlin. He died thinking he was a failure. His company was liquidated. His blueprints were lost or burned. The US Army eventually adopted a different suspension, Volute Springs, for the Sherman tank, just to avoid paying him royalties. But physics doesn't care about royalties. The T-34, powered by Christie's suspension, remained in service for 50 years. His concept of long travel suspension became the standard for every modern main battle tank. Today, the T-34 is remembered as the tank that saved Russia. The Crusader is remembered as the tank that saved Africa. But the name Christie? It is usually found only in the fine print of engineering textbooks. He was arrogant. It was difficult. He was a traitor who sold to the Soviets. But in the end, John Walter Christie was right. He proved that a tank didn't have to crawl. He gave the iron beasts wings.